Tusk. Yep. <laughs> Is this the mic? Alright. Okay, thanks to Bob, a terrific friend and role model. Charles Barkley turned down that job years ago and Bob picked it up. Um, his encouragement of my taking myself seriously as a writer. Can people hear? Yeah. Okay. Here's a recent email from Bob. Just read Elizabeth Drew on Trump in the New York Review of Books. I had to thought your writing was even more like hers than it is like Roger Angel's. Neither you nor she relies on interviews to carry your points. Both of you have this deep knowledge of your subject and pull your points out of these depths to serve your topic at hand. I like this not only because it frees me up and pronounces me beyond the law, but because other people too have compared my writing to Roger Angel's on baseball, I don't think of myself as his peer, but I know what they mean. He liked my stuff when I said it to him decades ago, but the New Yorker had already passed on it. Okay, so for about 30 years, I've published annual pieces on the college and pro basketball seasons. But nothing becomes fish wrap sooner than the sports section, so I'll read mostly from my recent ones, as well as for some shorter, more occasional pieces if there's time. Sports metaphors quickly become cliches. The challenge is to use them well with a twist of irony that nods equally to resemblance and difference. Basketball has an inherent balletic beauty. Coach Jack Ramsey, Bill Walton's coach, and NBA called it ballet plus defense. And I tried to juxtapose its essence with how it's marketed, exploited, and delivered to us by the media. So this focus on the intersection of marketing and the aesthetic per uh, perfection that I see in basketball, Oscar Robertson, Elgin Bailey, and Bill Walton above all, has come together in the fascinating persona of LeBron James, the subject of many of my recent pieces. The way I put it earlier was, basketball is an incomparably beautiful game, played by indisputably the world's most gifted athletes. Matched for grace only by ballet, where even less defense is played. <laughs> its inherent jazz rhythms, great Elgin Baylor here notwithstanding, as a professional sport, has long crossed the line into becoming part of the problem, having been nearly completely swallowed by the vast conglomerate of media and advertising interests that govern the infotainment industry, rather than the solution, which would allow the fast disappearing essence of basketball to evolve into the high art form that Michael Jordan's extraterrestrial flights have suggested to his legion of admirers, young and old. So it's a little similar, you know, there's, a, there's good stuff and there's institutions that, that, that fuck it up. <laughs> Some similarity. <laughs> Anyhow, this is from my most recent piece on last year's NBA season, published online at first of the month. I decided to write it before the finals because I could see what was going to happen next and I knew I wouldn't like it. It's called True to the Game. What does it mean to be a true fan, a lover of the game of basketball? Certainly more than simply being loyal to the home team, but what exactly? We can't ask the help of the data analytics department because we're dealing with something more ethereal than data, something like spirit. Better than to ask, who are the custodians of the spiritual legacy bequeathed by Elgin, Oscar, Wilt, Bob Pettit, and Bill Russell, that marvelous cadre of players who transformed the meaning of basketball during the 1950s, when the league was struggling for legitimacy, popularity, and cultural re relevance. Growing up four subway stops from the 50th Street Garden during the pre-Fraser Reed era, I found the Knicks to be hardly worth it. I rooted instead for Pettit St. Louis Hawks. Thus unmoored from the dictates of partisan geographic loyalty, I have since felt free to root for teams and individual players that epitomize the way basketball should be played. Unless they were the Celtics, of course. Though I did agonize about that when Bill Walton came to the Celtics for a year. There's a piece I'm not going to read about that, but it's contraband, actually. Um, this even briefly included the Knicks when they played perfect team ball under Red Holzman, but also Walt's Portland Trailblazers during their charmed year and a half 
where tragedy stops, uh, struck. Okay, so here's a trigger warning for warrior fans. Um, so why don't I like this Golden State juggernaut, which often brings smart passing and unselfish play to the level of the Knicks and Blazers teams I love? Let me count the ways. Should I? No, better just to summarize. The toxic mix of jingoism, triumphalism, entitlement, self-righteousness, and lack of a sense of reality that characterizes the arena, the fans, the management, and extends to antics like the shimmying Steph Curry indulged in after getting hot against Houston. How does that not qualify as taunting? Instead, it's seen as a form of, a form of enthusiasm and cuteness, indicative of the same mentality that spawned the nickname Hampton Five for the combination of Kevin Durant and the four star players who accomplished their mission of convincing him to betray Russell Westbrook and the OKC franchise, which he'd already trashed by reverting to playing hero ball in the decisive sixth game of the Western Final against his new suitors, in the name of ruining the league's competitive balance. Enough, we've come to praise LeBron James, not to bury Kevin Durant. <laughs> so, um, I, as I say, I wrote this before the finals because I had an idea what was going to happen, and it did, um, the sweep. And this is from the Boston-Cleveland Eastern final series. People out here may or may not know there's an Eastern Conference as well. <laughs> and I think that just no. LeBron James comes out here to play the Warriors every year. It's not so. Um, okay, Game 6 was notable for one spectacular play that epitomized what separates James from even the extraordinary pack of young, great young players that formed the echelon just before their universally acknowledged king. With his team comfortably ahead in the third quarter, James scored a layup on a fast break, with his momentum naturally carrying him past the end line, leaving him several steps behind when the Celtics quickly inbounded to take advantage of a ready-made five-month four fast break. James could easily have sat the next possession out. In other words, there were ahead 10 to 15 points he had scored. Big effort to get back. Easy to take a break at that point. Instead, he began jogging briskly up court, tracking, stealthily stalking, stealthily stalking the Celtic break. Unseen by his prey, the unsuspecting Terry Rozier, the eventual recipient of the pass that James had diagnosed would be coming. Timing his leap perfectly, LeBron suddenly obliterated Rozier's layup in what has become his signature style on chase down blocks, a frightening Will Chamberlain-like maneuver that may not have existed as a phenomenon before James's time. This breathtaking play was as remarkable, was as remarkable for its conception as for its execution, perfectly exemplifying not only James's physical superiority, but his determination, effort, and subtly nuanced understanding of the game. These qualities supplement the God-given talent that makes him the first player to rival Wilt for all-around physical dominance, with what Jeff Van Gundy calls his, quote, superhuman strength. Many years ago, you know that people know that there's an acronym, GOAT, that means greatest of all time. I've only found out about it recently, but I think it's been around a while. Many years ago, I dove into the goat waters by asserting that by dint of his unique combination of superior all-court skills, speed, and overpowering strength, James was on his way to obliterating the hitherto oblig obligatory dichotomy between best overall player and best big man, a hedging of bets in the goat wars that was previously inconceivable. This was at a time when the NBA was in a period of mild post-Jordan decline, and I had just about lost interest in watching, figuring I'd pretty much seen it all. LeBron changed all that. I greedily watched him whenever I could, because there was always a pretty good chance I'd see something entirely unprecedented, like that chase down block. It's still true. James's newly stabilized jump shot suggests that he is honing his skills to prepare for the time almost unimaginable as it had been in Wilt's heyday, when his athleticism no longer simply overwhelms opponents. Combining these acquired skills and inherent physical gifts with his superior basketball IQ makes him simply the best player ever. 
As with Rogier's layup, the dichotomy has been erased. One could even say transcended. All right, something else about the NBA from this year? Or should I change gears? People tolerate more of this opinionated stuff? Okay, good. Uh, over the years, as the league became progressively more prosperous on its way to evolving into a fraternity of multimillionaires, the all-star game has become increasingly meaningless. With the carnival aspects of the weekend overwhelming the game itself, a gradual change that was greatly accelerated when TNT swept the enterprise away from network television in 2002. The NBA is no longer the sentimental dance hall league of its infancy. TNT now sports a 24-hour cable station that caters to a great demographic that responds to advertising for fashionable men's divorce attorney firms like Schmuck and Schmuck, <laughs> and, use, and looks to entice and protect DUI defendants from license jeopardizing legal action, using the catchy slogan, no cuffs. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, NRA representatives have not as yet stepped up for a piece of the action, but perhaps it's only a matter of time. Abetted by rule changes lim limiting defensive hand checking, it's truly become a shooter's league. The league evolved rapidly after 1954, adding a new archetype of the agile big man, Pettit and Russell. A luminous cadre of black players transformed the game, with Elgin Baylor, Luke Chamberlain, and Oscar Robertson entering the league one each year over a span of three seasons. The last of these three to come aboard in 1960, Oscar brought with him a self-taught textbook game that represented both the invention and the perfection of all the elements of modern basketball. What aspect of the modern game did Oscar not perfect? You say his range and outside shot were not quite those of Jerry West, but had the three-point shot existed then, Oscar would undoubtedly have developed the, the range he instead disdained preferring to nudge out that extra foot while taunting would-be shot blockers. You'll get the next one, big fella. When the bamboozled defender would go up another two inches higher, so would Oscar, all the while repeating his taunting mantra. But yes, the rules have changed. Whereas talk used to be that the way to help smaller players survive was to raise the baskets to 11 or 12 feet. A totally misguided idea, because it hurt the little man far more than, than the big man who could simply put the ball in. Um, the introduction of the three-point shot in 1979 turned out completely unexpectedly to be the progenitor of seismic change. Great outside shooters like Steph Curry became able to contend for MVP trophies and inspire wrong-headed if well-meaning comparisons to all-time greats whose physical gifts were far greater, as are those not only of LeBron James, but a host of contemporary stars I named four of them only for that. Um, Oscar Robertson has always been my North Star. Curry shoots from, far, from too far away for me to have it clearly in view. Um, the reverberations from the introduction of the three-point shot have spawned the sea change in the type sea change in the type of players coveted by championship contending teams and all others as well making it difficult to compare players of different eras because radically different skill sets are now required. For example, the barring the, of defensive hand checking has made Curry's slithery elusiveness a prized skill in ways not previously imagined. For my money, defensive stoppers from earlier eras, eras, Al Adel being a prime example, would have shut Curry down and bruised him in the process, but that was under the old rules. The Al Adels of today tried to play Curry in the same way the Battle Robertson and West would have six personal fouls in no time at all. All right, I want to read. Do we have time for something more? Or what do you think? Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, what would you? What do you think of what uh, Oscar and Barkley said about Curry? They say, you know, they that defenses just should beat the hell out of them, and that and that 
that would stop it, which is kind of what you're alluding to. But it seems to me that that's not the kind of basketball I like. It's not hitting people, or pushing people, rather than being elegant. Uh, what well, do you, what do you think? What I think is that, uh, first of all, I agree completely with Oscar Robinson, Charles Clark, and I was very happy to see him say it. But I don't think, I mean, the prototype of a thug team to me is the New York Knicks teams of the Charles Oakley, Patrick Ewing here. They really knocked people down for the sake of knocking people down, and it wasn't basketball anymore. I don't think, I certainly don't think that's what Oscar's talking about. Barkley says things because he likes to say things, and I generally like the things he says. But, you know, if Oscar, Oscar isn't talking about roughing someone up unnecessarily, he's talking about the kind of physical defense that they used to allow you to play. And I think that's what he, what he objects to. You can't put your, your hands on this guy. I think he probably also objects to the idea of backing up further and further to make your shot. Because he played at a time when, as I was talking about, getting a 10-footer, they gave you a 10-footer if you wanted an 8-footer. And to back up to 22 feet was just a bad shot. You know, you only got two points for it. So I think that's the change. Um, so what do you think? The, yeah. I would like to ask you about questions about the writing. One is, how are you consciously sometimes using first names and last names? Uh, and I was trying to figure out, I couldn't see a pattern, but I'm wondering uh -huh. if you were consciously I, I, using a pattern. Definitely, I love that question. And, and <laughs> sort, of re sort of related to it is, uh, you only use the word black once. And the NBA, it seems to me, is, all of, is in many ways is about these fabulous African-American athletes mm -hmm. out there in a way that is not true in any other sport. And so I wonder, have you written about that? Does that play into what you're I've written about a here? lot about that, and I, I was a little bit reluctant to bring that up because I don't know people, and people can misinterpret it, you know, very easily. But the race subtext is tremendous about basketball. I mean, I, I wrote a piece about Jeremy Lin. The idea, like, now there's three races. You know, we just uh, didn't know what to make of Jeremy Lin. And I, I play with with, the, with that idea in, in ways that, you know, I could probably in this crowd I could get away with it, but in a lot of places I couldn't. Um, you know, there's a lot of jokes. There's a lot of you know, lore of that basketball. Just to turn white man's disease. People probably know me, you can't jump. Oh, and it's constantly, you know, all of that. And I love to write about it, but I didn't feel comfortable exposing much of that. Although if I read the next piece, then, then I might, then there's a little of that. And then what about the but, first But the first stage, yeah, names. that's great. Um, I, I'm very conscious of it, partly as a matter of writing. You don't want to say Oscar five times in the same paragraph. It, 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 it's a, a matter of cadences, musicality, how it sounds to you. Uh, so I try to do my best about that. But the interesting thing to me, I remember writing about Michael Jordan when he came up, he was he suddenly was Michael. And <coughs> there had been no ordinary first man that would do for anybody else. Oh, Wilt, Oscar. yes, Oscar. but that's not an ordinary name. Oh, okay. I, or I'm not thinking of it as a right. Oscar, you know who you meant. But the kids couldn't say Bill. I mean, everybody knew you meant Russell. Uh, or Bob. Is it Kuzi? Is it Teddy? Is it someone else? And so it was a kind of measure of Jordan's ascent to some other level that you know he was he was known as Michael. Um, so that's Yeah, I mean that, that's what I'm what I'm conscious of when, when I write or when I'm talking about I don't know, could you say Larry? I mean we, 
I guess everybody would, but she wouldn't, you call him Bird. You know, works, works better. You might think of Larry Faust. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> So, should I read another piece or should I read a couple of quick poems? Or should I stop? So I wrote a little poem about LeBron James. Um, the only poem I've ever published. It's called Fighting City Hall, Free Agency, from LeBron James. Now I wrote this after the Warriors signed Cousins. And LeBron had made this move to become a championship contender in LA, it seemed anyway. And then suddenly the Warriors signed Cousins. And you know from listening to me all my biases about this. So this only confirms them. Departing Cleveland from moisture pastures, he left for what he hoped would be more, four more rings. L.A., SoCal, revenge from just 400 miles below the locked and loaded enemy. A triumph over Curry, Green, Durant, Thompson. The four stalwarts standing at the threshold of the King of the Cross. The bastions he'd stormed, Luke Walton at his side, the magic man having his back. This was his best shot. He had worked hard for this one. Away now, away from J.R. Smith, the talentless Tristan T. Initials, names, all of them. It was his best shot. He jumped, he announced, he took, yes, his best shot, and saw it wiped out of the air cleanly by Boogie Cousins. <laughs> Okay. So, I see the cafe.